Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Insights from the NCVS Data for the Victim Assistance Field. Who might we be missing? My name is Susan Howley and I'm the Program Manager for the Center for Victim Research. The center is built through a partnership of researchers and practitioners at the Justice Research and Statistics Association, the National Center for Victims of Crime, and the Urban Institute. The center's mission is to serve as a one-stop resource for victim service providers and researchers to connect and share knowledge to increase access to victim research and data and the utility of research and data collection to crime victim services nationwide. Today's webinar will do both of those things by using data from the NCVS to provide insights into victimization and victim services. This webinar and all activities of the Center for Victim Research are supported by funding from the Office for Victims of Crime, Office of Justice Programs, U.S. Department of Justice. The opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in this webinar are those of the contributors and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the U.S. Department of Justice. We are honored today to welcome two highly respected researchers, Heather Warnkin, Visiting Fellow at the Bureau of Justice Statistics and the Office for Victims of Crime, and Janet Luritsen at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. We're so pleased to have them with us today to present this important information to you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Heather. Heather, welcome. Thank you, Susan, and thank you so much to everyone for joining us. I'd like to start by providing a brief overview of our goals for today. As many of our participants know, this is an exciting time in the victim assistance field, one of unprecedented growth and change. This webinar will focus on how data from the National Crime Victimization Survey, the nation's primary source of information on victimization, can help inform the victim assistance, public health, and broader criminal justice community in key funding and policy decisions impacting the lives of survivors and the frontline service providers working to meet their needs every day all across the country. Every year, the Bureau of Justice Statistics publishes an annual report on the NCVS data. Though these reports themselves are helpful guideposts for these issues, today we're gonna to go a little bit deeper. We'll be sharing findings about who is at greatest risk for violence and who are most and least likely to access services. Special emphasis will be placed on issues of race, ethnicity, gender, age, income, and place. Though the NCVS data is publicly available, it is often challenging for those without the training and skill set, such as that of the brilliant Dr. Janet Lauritsen, who again, we're so lucky to have with us today, to do their own analysis. This includes in pursuit of information not easily answered through the annual NCVS reports. For example, being able to look at victims and their related needs and access challenges intersectionally, considering multiple characteristics at once. This type of analysis, taking multiple factors into consideration simultaneously is critical, more reflective of the many factors in person, impacting any person's experience in life. We'll be considering this information at a time when historic funding levels and increased flexibility in the use of victim assistance resources make data-driven strategies and return on investment as critical as ever. As we go, please feel free to use the chat box to post comments or questions, and we'll also plan to leave additional time for your questions at the end. Kicking us off also with some important additional context to frame today's conversation. In 2013, OBC released a groundbreaking report, Vision 21 the culmination of a years-long effort engaging a diversity of stakeholders across the country, Vision 21 was the first major assessment of the victim assistance field in over 15 years, taking a deep dive into how far have we come and perhaps most importantly, how far do we still have to go? Through Vision 21, OVC issued a series of findings and corresponding recommendations summarized on your screen, offering a blueprint for the work for years to come. This included a recognition of the dearth of research and analysis pertinent to key issues in the field, 
and the corresponding commitment to support the development of a body of evidence-based knowledge on victimization, trends, services, and behaviors. Quoting directly from the report, victims will be served through a national commitment to support robust, ongoing research and program evaluation that informs the quality and practice of victim services throughout the nation. Evidence-based, research-informed victim service programs will become the standard of excellence in providing assistance and support to victims of all types of crime. Vision 21 also recognized the need to bridge the long-standing and seemingly intractable translation gap between researchers, practitioners, and policymakers in the field, noting that federal agencies must move beyond supportive language and take concrete action to create better linkages for victims and survivors. Putting its money where its mouth is, OVC has over the past few years funded a number of groundbreaking initiatives to support these goals, starting with the Bridging the Gap initiative wrapping in 2015, the launch of two national resource centers to support the field, including our host for today, the Center for Victim Research, as well as a national resource center for reaching all victims, led by the Vera Institute of Justice, and a number of critical partner organizations focused on different communities of frequently underserved and marginalized survivor populations, including youth victims, boys and men of color, LGBTQ, victims with disabilities, formerly incarcerated, those with limited English proficiency and who may be deaf or hard of hearing, elderly, women of color, tribal, and other historically marginalized groups. These commitments also brought the partnerships between OBC and its sister agencies at the Department of Justice, including the Bureau of Justice Statistics, to the next level of collaboration in furtherance of these goals, with BJS leading the historic development of the first ever Victim Services Statistical Research Program, which we'll share a little bit more about later in the webinar. And lastly, OVC also launched the first ever in-house position to support the translation and dissemination of data and research for the field. And I'm honored to be serving in that role since January of 2016. So why does this all matter now? Well, as I noted, the field is in an exciting state of unprecedented growth and change, particularly since 2015, when in lifting the appropriations cap on the Crime Victims Fund, Congress effectively quadrupled the amount of available resources for victim assistance through the Victims of Crime Act Formula Grant Program, or VOCA. To give you a sense of the magnitude of this shift, the funding appropriations cap was $745 million in fiscal year 14, jumping to $2.36 billion the following year. This monumental increase has held steady and within the past year jumped yet again, with the CVF limit set at $4.4 billion in FY18. Of this, state victim assistance grants distributed from the federal government through OVC to all 50 states and territories totaled $3.3 billion, an 80% increase from the previous year. Additionally, a new rule issued in August of 2016 interpreting the allowable uses of these funds provided the field with greater flexibility in key areas for reaching all victims and enhancing services. These new tools include, for example, the possibility of using resources for needs such as civil legal aid, transitional housing, increased flexibility for funding mental health and substance use treatment, restorative justice, and multi-system, multidisciplinary response. It also removed a decades-long prohibition on using these funds to serve victims who are incarcerated. This all amounts to unprecedented opportunities for training, evidence-based collaboration, evidence-based decision-making, further collaboration, and delineation of roles within the field. So as you can see, the, measurable, the measurable impact of this quadrupling of resources is already more remarkable, with the number of subgrants funded nationally skyrocketing to approximately 14,000 for the provision of direct services by various government entities, community-based organizations, and other types of providers and programs serving victims nationwide. A new report released just weeks ago on the OVC website 
provides information on these expenditures and the types of services provided, as well as demographic and other information on those served. This all demonstrates that a meaningful return on these investments is as critical as ever. We'll now turn things over to Janet. Okay. Thank you, Heather, for setting the context for um, what I'm going to be speaking about next. I want to talk about some relevant findings for this um, for these efforts uh, that have been derived from the NCBS. But before turning to our findings, I'd like to ask the audience a question. Um, how many of you have used the BJS NCVS data tool or any other NCVS data set to conduct your own analyses about issues that you might be interested in learning about? If you've used it, would you please check the, 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 green, the green arrow? And if you haven't checked that, I'll assume, or you checked the red box, I'm assuming that that's not something that you've done. I just want to uh, learn more about how comfortable people are with the data tools that are available uh, or whether perhaps more research resources are, would be very helpful. So thank you. I'll, take, I'll come back to look at that in a, in a bit. Okay. Um, so what our analyses uh, using the NCBS are designed to do today is address some of the most common and fundamental questions about who is in need of victim assistance services, who accesses these services, and whether these patterns have changed over time. I'll begin with a very brief description of the data. The NCVS began in 1973, and it is an ongoing survey of persons ages 12 and older that's conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau for the Bureau of Justice Statistics. Its sample is designed to be nationally representative of persons living in households in the U.S. The NCVS is a very important and unique data source for studying victimization because it includes incidents not reported to the police, and it has a high participation rate and a large sample size, which is very important to help ensure that the estimates from the data are reliable and cover a broad range of victims. The survey questionnaire uses plain language rather than legalistic terms, is conducted in English and Spanish as well as other languages under some circumstances, and since 1993 it's also asked victims whether they've received help from a victim assistance agency. Now, all data sources and surveys have limitations, and I want to note a few about the NCVS here. Because the NCVS uses a household-based sample design, information about victimization does not include the experiences of persons not living in households, such as those who are homeless or those who are living in institutions, such as jails and prisons or in nursing homes. Another issue of concern is that the survey methodology may underestimate rape and sexual assaults BJS is currently studying this issue for purposes of making improvements in the methodology. So underscoring this point, understanding the strengths and limitations of this data source is critical for translating the significance of these findings for policy and practice. So please keep in mind as we share findings that given who is not in the NCVS sample, this may reflect just the tip of the iceberg for many of the most vulnerable categories of survivors often subject to repeat and poly-victimization and in greatest need of services, such as those who are homeless, transient, in and out of correctional facilities, and young children under 12, as Janet mentioned. I'd also like to note that we received and so appreciated the questions that many of you submitted already at registration, many of which spoke to some of these exact populations that the NCVS does not cover directly, or victimization types it does not cover, such as homicide. So again, please keep this in mind as part of our collective thought process as well on the other sources of data and research pursuits necessary to give voice to the experience of these victims. Okay, so just to talk a, few, a bit about some key data items and definitions before I begin, today I'll be focusing on describing the survivors of serious violent victimization, which is defined here as any experience of rape or sexual assault robbery or aggravated assault, which is an assault involving a weapon or resulting in serious bodily injury. We'll also examine the victim-offender relationship, a few other characteristics about those incidents, and whether the survivors received any help or advice from a victim assistance agency or office. The characteristics that we'll focus on today include the victim's gender, race and ethnicity, their age, household income, and the general type of area they reside in. 
And one type of an, <clears throat> excuse me, analysis that we'll show here that's not typically found in BJS reports is a simultaneous consideration of victim characteristics to learn how they may intersect to affect risk for serious violence and receipt of victim assistance. We begin by updating a key figure from the last BJS report about the trends in serious violence and access of victim assistance to learn how this may have changed since 2009, the time of the last report. What we see here is that the overall levels of violent victimization and the use of victim assistance have fluctuated some, but not changed substantially since 2009. There's a slight increase in assistance over the last couple of years, but the level in 2015 is also similar to what it was in 2003 to 2006. So we will need to wait until the 2017 data is released at the end of this year to learn whether the use of assistance increased most recently during that period when more funds became available. Next, we examine whether victim assistance use varies by type of violent victimization and whether that changed over time. During 1993 to 2009, survivors of rape and sexual assault were more likely to re receive victim assistance compared to victims of other forms of violence, and we see that this is still true in the more recent period. During 2010 to 2015, 20% of the survivors of rape and sexual assault report that they received assistance compared to about 7 to 8% of robbery and aggravated assault survivors. We also see little change over time in receipt of victim assistance according to the victim-offender relationship of the incident. About 21% of intimate partner violence victims received assistance, and the rates are lower if the offender was someone known to the victim but not an intimate partner, or if the offender is a stranger. So the basic pattern has not changed much over time, and it is clear that the vast majority of violent crime survivors do not access victim assistance. Picking up on the significance of this point for the field, given the considerable rights afforded to and services intended for all victims that have now been codified in federal, state, and local law since the advent of the victims' rights movement in the 1970s and 80s, these percentages are strikingly low. Since the passage of VOCA in 1984, over 32,000 laws and policies have proliferated in the U.S. on behalf of victims, including the passage of constitutional pr protections for victims in 35 states and counting. The persistently low levels of self-reported access to help suggest a disconnect between policy and reality, a failure to deliver on the promises now made to all victims. Keep in mind, once again, that this number hovering around 10% excludes many of the most vulnerable survivors facing the greatest access challenges. Though the victim assistance and to some extent public health fields have been grappling with this disconnect for some time, the broader criminal justice field and public discourse surrounding it seldom acknowledges or contextualizes these facts. Given the increased attention at all levels that criminal justice reform has received in recent years, including bipartisan attention in Congress and state legislatures grappling with the need for smart, sensible, data-driven approaches that provide a return on investment of public safety dollars, the statistical picture of the experience of those most impacted by crime is often strikingly absent from the debate. Okay, so next we're going to examine how Various characteristics are associated with a person's risk for serious violence, and we'll also consider whether some of those relationships may have changed over time. This is important because we need to know for whom the risk is greatest and whether our understandings of who we might be missing may be based on facts that may have changed. We're going to begin by looking at the trends in serious violence for males and females, and then for different race and ethnic groups. So here are the long-term trends in serious violence for males and females. What's immediately apparent to the eye is that the risks for both groups have declined since the 1970s, particularly so during the 1990s, and then they have remained fairly stable over the last 10 or so years. But we also see that the gap between the two trends is closed, and this suggests that the risk of serious violence in the recent period is roughly the same for males and females. We can confirm that this is the case by examining what's called the risk ratio, which is the female rate divided by the male rate and shown by the dotted line in the figure. This ratio line has increased over time in a fairly consistent way and has recently hit the value of 1, indicating that the risk for violence is roughly equal for males and females. 
thus the gender gap is closed, and the trends and the rates tell us that this has happened because the declines in male victimization have been greater than the declines in female victimization. Now, I should note that the reasons behind the closing of the gender gap are unknown, in part because the phenomenon is recent and because few researchers are studying it closely. I'm currently working on a project with one of my colleagues, Karen Heimer, to assess the evidence for, uh, for a variety of explanations about this, ranging from methodological and sampling issues to the nature of the changes in the different forms of violence that men, <clears throat> excuse me, men and women may experience, as well as uh, investigating the possible impacts of broader changes in society on violence. But if anybody would like to share their comments about this, issue with me, I'd be happy to receive them because we're really at a very early starting point in this investigation. In the next slide, we're examining the trends for the three largest race and ethnic groups in the U.S., non-Hispanic blacks and whites and Hispanics. Here we also see declines in risk for serious violence over the long term, and it appears that the gaps in risk between these race and ethnic groups may have closed over time as well. However, in this instance, the eye is somewhat deceived. As was the case for males and females, we have to take a close look at the risk ratio trends for each of the groups versus the others before drawing conclusions. And I'll show this next on a separate slide because they would be difficult to see clearly if super, superimposed on this figure here. By examining the risk ratios, we see here that there is no clear trend in the gaps in serious violence between blacks, whites, and Latinos. The differences in the risk ratios fluctuate over time, but unlike the male-female risk ratio we just viewed, race and ethnic gaps in risk for serious violence have not closed over time. Blacks' risk for serious violence have remained about one and a half to two times greater than those of whites over the past four decades, and Latinos have had risks that have been roughly 1.2 to 1.5 times greater than those of whites during those same time period. So there are three takeaway messages from these long-term trend figures. First, we have to be careful not to draw conclusions about the importance of any factor based solely on what our eyes seem to tell us about group differences and trends. Second, race and ethnicity continue over time to differentiate who is most likely to become a survivor of serious violence in the U.S. And third, the association between characteristics such as gender and the risk for violence can change over time and should be continuously examined to make more informed decisions about the targeting of services and need. So this underscores exactly why collaboration between researchers, practitioners, and policymakers is key, as well as a meaningful place at the table for those most impacted. It's an example of where it takes a sophisticated and specific analysis to produce a relevant takeaway for the field, one not obvious to the untrained eye. In this case, critical findings about the persistent role of race and ethnicity in assessing risk of victimization and need for services. So now, because they constitute a comparatively small proportion of the U.S. population and therefore a small proportion of the NCVS sample data, we cannot easily do the same kind of analyses for other race and ethnic groups. However, by combining several years of the data, we can learn more about the risks associated with race and ethnicity for other groups. And in this slide, we see that non-Hispanic American Indians and persons indicating that they are of mixed race experienced the highest risk for serious violence during the 2010 to 2015 period. The relative risk ratio is about 2.4 times greater for American Indians than it is for whites. That's about 140% higher and roughly 4.1 greater times greater for persons of mixed races compared to non-Hispanic whites. So among these groups in particular, we should expect to find the greatest proportion of survivors of serious violence, although there is uh, comparatively little research in their victimization experiences. And again, these are staggering numbers, and though relatively small portions of the population as a whole, obviously they present critical implications for the field in both recognizing unique and disproportionate service needs and also in the attention to investment in appropriate culturally specific strategies to meet these needs. So next we're going to examine a wide range of factors simultaneously to get a fuller interpretation of the communities and groups where experiences of serious violence are most common. <clears throat> 
So here we're going beyond gender, race, and ethnicity, and also considering age, household income, and the type of area in which persons reside simultaneously. And we need to consider these additional factors because some of the patterns we observed, for example, between the race and ethnic groups, may be due to the fact that the different groups are more likely to experience other conditions that are themselves associated with risk, such as poverty. So the table on the left side of this slide shows us odds ratios, which help reveal how much each of these factors influence risk when other factors are also taken into account. When the odds ratio is greater than one and marked with an asterisk, it means that this characteristic is associated with a significantly higher risk than the comparison group, and if it's less than one and with an asterisk, it indicates that this characteristic is associated with lower risk. The comparison groups for each of the measures are listed in the box on the lower right-hand side of the slide. So what the results in this table show is that during the 2010 to 15 period, each of these factors here had an independent association with the risk for serious violence. We find that persons ages 35 and above have lower risks than those who are younger, that persons living in households earning more than $25,000 annually have risks for serious violence that are less than half of those, that of those earning less than $25,000, and that persons living in non-metropolitan or rural areas and those living in suburbs, that is, places adjacent to cities, have risks for violence that are lower than those living in metropolitan city areas. So this shows that us that economic and residential area status also are important factors as our age, sex, race, and ethnicity, and that the combination of these characteristics tells us some, something important about who the survivors of violence are. We can also use the information from these types of analyses to see the combination of these effects, that is, how they add up to produce higher levels of risk among some persons than others. And so we're going to do that in the next slide. Excuse me. There we go. Okay. On the left side of this slide, the re results we found in the previous analysis are used to estimate the serious violence rates for the highest groups in the U.S. And on the right side, we estimate the comparable rates for the lowest risk groups. So these numbers provide perhaps a more intuitive understanding of the previous results, and the comparison shows us where survivors of, sur of, survivors of serious violence are most often to be found. The highest risk group consists of persons under age 35 living in urban areas and those living in or near poverty, that is, they're in households with less than $25,000 a year. Among these <clears throat> poor young urban residents, we see that male and female rates are actually fairly similar to each other and that race and ethnic differences under these conditions are relatively small. The rates for the lowest risk groups appear on the right side. This includes persons 55 and older, living outside of cities, and those with annual incomes of $75,000 or more. The risks for violence among this group are much lower. On average, they are about one-tenth the risk of those in the highest rate groups. This can be seen by comparing, for example, the white females in each group, where the risk for young, poor, urban white females is 11.5 compared to 1.1 for the older, wealthier, non-urban white females. And if we study these numbers further, we see that the group at highest risk is young, poor, urban black males, whose risk for violence is approximately 13 to 15 times greater than the lowest risk groups in the United States. So these rate comparisons tell us that although survivors of serious violence can be found across the country and in many places, they are most prevalent among younger, poor, I'm sorry, among younger persons in the poorest urban areas. And in these areas, we should expect to find a need for victim services for persons, of, for persons of all genders, races, and ethnicities. Although That said, although the risk is greater in urban areas compared to elsewhere, it should be emphasized that this does not mean that we will not find survivors in other types of areas. In fact, here we are displaying the risk for violence among younger and poorer persons residing in the different types of areas. The highest risks continue to be experienced by those living in the poorest households, regardless of whether those households are in cities, suburban areas, or in rural or non-metropolitan areas. So just recapping some of what Janet has shared in the past few slides, this really demonstrates the utility for the field in looking at the full continuum of risk, one that goes beyond 
overgeneralizations based on a single characteristic. So again, just underscoring what this looks like at the two ends of the continuum. The black males under the age of 35 who live in urban areas and in households with annual incomes under $25,000 a year have a risk for serious violent victimization that is roughly 15 times greater than that of females who are over 55 55 and older and living in non-urban areas and in households with incomes of 75,000 and over. We'll talk a little bit more later in the webinar about the implications of this, including considerations these findings may have in the context of our current victim assistance expenditures. So next, now we're going to turn our attention away from risk and examine which survivors of serious violence are most likely to receive assistance. Now recall that only about 10% of victims of violence access victim services. Um, this means that we're going to find it difficult to learn from the data how all these factors work in combination um, to affect whether or not victims receive services. But we can use the data to obtain a general view of where the gaps may be greatest to help better target the underserved. And this table indicates that there are only a few differences in victim assistance access that appear noteworthy. In the case of gender, we see that females are more than twice as likely as males to access victim services. For each of the other victim characteristics, we observe only very small differences in access, and these are not large enough to say that they constitute a statistically significant pattern or a substantively large pattern. Instead, the findings suggest that the vast majority of survivors of serious violence do not access victim services, and the victim assistance agencies have had more success reaching female victims than male victims of violence. When we examine whether this pattern might perhaps be associated with the types of violence that females and males experience, we see that this matters somewhat, but also that the differences are found across the different forms of violence. For example, female victims of rape and sexual assault and female victims of intimate partner violence are the survivors who are most likely to access victim assistance. But we also see that female victims of robbery are more likely than male victims of robbery to do so. When we investigate whether differences in injuries might help account for this, we learn that those who suffer bodily injuries from violence are more likely to receive assistance but also that injured females are more likely than injured males to do so. Therefore, regardless of the type of violence, male survivors are less likely than female survivors to access assistance, though both groups are doing so at, at, compared at low levels. Now our final two slide, analysis slides will examine how crime reporting and receipt of medical care may be related to victim assistance, perhaps serving as gateway institutions of information for victims. There have been efforts by many victim assistance organizations to better engage the police and medical facilities in treatment and support of victims, and we examine whether this appears to have improved over time. Now here we see um, a, a repeat of some numbers from a previous BJS report that has shown that victims of violence whose experiences reported to the police are more likely to access victim assistance. And our updated information from the more recent 2010 to 15 period indicates that this is still the case. However, the data are also telling us that there have been no notable improvements in access over time when the police have been notified. In the recent period, 13% victims whose violence was reported to the police received assistance compared to 14% during the 2000s. This considerable difference among those who report victimization versus those who do not has implications for the structure and affiliation available services. In other words, whether victim services are found within the justice system and or have an association with criminal justice entities versus services and access points found within the community. It has considerations regarding an expansion of the available services to venues unaffiliated with the justice system, such as hospitals, a diversity of community-based organizations, schools, and more. If the NCVS data tells us that only approximately 58% of serious violent victimizations were reported to police from 2010 to 2015, that shows 
that a huge number remain unreported, and that this statistical connection between reporting crime and accessing help is especially relevant in communities and among groups that may have particularly strained or distrusting relationships with law enforcement. This also suggests that the current focus nationally on police community relations in criminal justice and other research and policy forums, as well as the public discourse, should include a discussion of the experience of crime survivors as relevant to improving upon these societal and public safety goals. This also has implications for the 18,000 police agencies nationally who are committed to improving their response to victims. What became of the 87% of serious violent crime victims who did report their victimization, yet did not receive access to services? Clearly, there are missed opportunities within this venue as well, some of which I explored in a recent article published just last month for National Crime Victims' Rights Week entitled, What Does the Data Tell Us About Law Enforcement-Based Victim Services?, which we will share for anyone who is interested in learning more in the chat box. Okay. Our, our last analysis slide here examines uh, how the uh, receipt of medical care uh, influences use of victim services. Similar to the previous slide, we see here that there have been no notable improvements over time in victim assistance use when injured victims receive medical care. Victims suffering from bodily injuries are more likely to receive assistance when they also receive medical care, but only about 16% of these victims did so in the recent period compared to 18% in the 2000, 2000s period. So together, these two slides suggest that victim engagement with other institutions, such as doctors and the hospitals, have, not, have also not yet led to increases in victim service access. So similar to the previous point made, this again has implications for the field in its consideration of potentially missed opportunities in hospitals and other public health venues likely to come into contact with survivors in need. The National Network of Hospital-Based Violence Intervention Programs and its partners have made tremendous strides in developing and supporting this highly successful model. Further bridge building and investment could yield considerable promise in connecting victims and families with much needed support beyond that of strictly medical care, bringing the availability of trauma-informed services in health settings from the exception to the rule. Well, thank you, Heather. I've passed the slide controller back to you. Great, thank you. So understanding this data on who is at highest risk for victimization and who is actually receiving services compared to that need is critical for policy and funding decisions, especially those designed to fill gaps that the data has long revealed. These findings demonstrate that characteristics of those most likely to report access to services do not always align with those most likely to experience certain types of serious violent victimization or the current expenditures in the field. For example, notwithstanding the data presented on the disproportionate risk for violent victimization experienced by young men of color, particularly 18 to 34-year-old poor urban black males, approximately 72% of VOCA dollars currently go to serving female victims, 53.2% to victims who are white. And we'll share the link to the VOCA Victim Assistance Report that highlights um, some of this information in, in the chat box. Females and males obviously differ in some ways in the extent to which they are victims of different forms of violence, and females are much more likely than males to be victims of certain crime types like rape and sexual assault and to be victimized by intimate partners. The report reveals that the current expenditures heavily favor services targeted to these crimes crime types, unsurprising given the historical roots of the field and its focus, and given the cultural progress in recognizing and supporting the need for these types of responses. These crime types remain incredibly important, as do access to services, and we still have a long way to go, even within these key areas of focus. But the full picture leaves opportunity for developing services tailored to meeting the needs of additional crime types and categories of victims as well. 
The findings also shed light on a number of other issues, and I hope that today's conversation has stimulated some of this thought process and conversation among key actors in the field. For example, challenges surrounding cultural humility and staffing of the victim assistance workforce. Do those providing services and on the front lines of meeting these needs match the survivors in need of in seeking those services? Do they reflect the diversity of survivors who may be seeking help? Overall, the patterns reinforce that the vast majority of victims do not access the services intended for them, and that the need for services is greatest in the poorest communities, regardless of whether those communities are located in urban, suburban, or rural locations. Each of these findings have implications for policymakers, funders, and practitioners in more effectively addressing the disparities in our responses to violence, barriers to access, such as crime reporting, and the possibilities presented by increasing access to services based on reporting and disclosure in other venues beyond the criminal justice system and in diversifying the venue and structure of available healing and support services to different points of access within communities. It also has implications for the challenges that the field faces surrounding the labeling and framing of services for those who are most frequently victimized. For example, even the word victim and victim services itself can present challenges, particularly for certain categories of survivors who may face challenges in self-identifying as a victim of crime. This often includes men. This often includes communities of color and other communities that have been marginalized and face challenges in having their needs as survivors seen and getting appropriate services when they do seek help. As I mentioned, I'm also going to share a quick note about other sources of data capable of further educating key decision makers within the field. The Bureau of Justice Statistics is leading the historic effort in the development of the Victim Services Statistical Research Program, again, in collaboration with OVC. These efforts to gather data from providers will represent information sources that we've never had before. Obviously, the NCVS has been around for decades collecting data directly from victims, but what we've never had is a statistical picture from the providers themselves. This effort includes the first ever national census of victim service providers fielded last year, which will, for the first time ever, create an entire geographic picture of all the survivors throughout the country. It also will include a more detailed survey using a representative sample from the NCVSP asking questions pertinent to the field. It also includes extending into other existing BJS collections, such as those focused on law enforcement, prosecutors, and others, corrections, to look at opportunities to ask questions about victim services needs and use to represent a full picture of these issues. It also represents a first ever collaboration with the National Center for Health Statistics to do research and development on the victim services needs in hospitals, an area that we've already underscored is highly relevant for the future of the field. BJS is also leading a redesign of the National Crime Victimization Survey and development of a subnational program. This includes new demographic variables added in July of 2016 on veteran status, citizenship, disability status, sexual orientation, and gender identity. It will include expanded current household income response categories and the ability to fill gaps in knowledge about service use satisfaction with police, and enhanced understanding of the consequences of victimization. It will include increased capacity to measure other crime types, and overall, a more complete picture of crime and safety at the local level. As we've covered today, the NCBS is already critical in the amount of information it provides, but this will be enhanced, providing new, more nuance and details on some of these key issues. <clears throat> 
Also, through the Victim Services Statistical Research Program and these brand new collections, obtaining information directly from providers themselves, we will get a more advanced picture of how many providers exist and what does the field look like. So, for example, the organizational structure of victim services, the types of services that these entities offer, the crime types served, staffing considerations, funding sources, VSP concerns, and more. As I mentioned, it will address victim services in hospitals and also research and development efforts on new information on services in homeless shelters and focused on victims with disability status of residents being served. Combining these sources with victimization data to, for the first time ever, address key questions for the field, such as, how does the geographic distribution of these victim service providers in states and cities compare to the crime distribution and other indicators of need that we've discussed today? We are also working on a corresponding paper that will also cover the findings that we've shared today that we hope will be released in the near future and distributed through the Center for Victim Research for those who are interested. We also so welcome your additional comments and questions today and moving forward, not just in order to stimulate these important conversations for the field, but to continue to inform the focus of this work. So please feel free to reach out to us at any time. And at this point, um, I know we've had a few questions come in already through the chat box that hopefully we can address, and others should feel free to chime in with questions and comments as well. Thank you, Heather. And while people are typing their questions in, and while Heather and Janet take a moment to see the questions that are in the chat box, um, I'm going to ask Jason to pop up the exit poll so that you can take your, um, let us know what you thought of today's presentation while we wait for those questions to come through. A lot, <clears throat> excuse me, there are a lot of questions, so it's a kind of, hold on a second. Well, I'll read this one aloud, and Thank this you. is for either Janet or Heather. Is there data that examines those victim assistance programs that have a, quote, first responder? We seek to find and access the, the victim. So the first responder approach that's going out to identify the victim versus a victim find and act, oh, versus waiting for the victim to find and access victim services. I'm not aware, uh, this is Janet, I'm not aware of any data on that issue, so unfortunately I can't, um, I can't answer that. I don't, I do not believe there is, but there may be something I'm not aware of. So I believe this question is speaking to the issue of diversifying services that we've talked about, really expanding the models and approaches to expand the access points for victims. Um, and as the question references that current uh, existing models that require a victim to be able to come forward, to be able to navigate where services are located and how providers can be contacted can pre present a host of challenges. So enhancing outreach um, to make sure that victims are identified in other ways and supported to get help can bring us a long way. And I referenced earlier the work of the National Resource Center on reaching all victims. And a lot of those partnerships that the Vera Institute of Justice has with leading providers throughout the country um, focused on various vulnerable populations of victims is currently working on not only developing 
uh, those types of models for enhanced outreach, developing the evidence base on what we know does and does not work, developing additional research questions of areas that need far more examination, and also providing training and technical assistance to existing entities in the field to diversify their tool belt in better reaching those that they're trying to, trying to serve. Thank you. We had another question, um, and that is, has the 10% of folk of victims that access victim services remained steady over time? Do we know that? Well, yes, we do. The, the, access, the first figure that I've shown, which I think will be available again uh, later on uh, when the webinar is posted, shows that it's, it's, it's been, there have been ups and downs, but it has mainly hovered around the 10% mark. It's not gone up more than 11 to 12 percent, and it was lower in the very early years when the data became collected, but, but it is still hovering and showing no clear trend beyond that 10 percent mark. Tells us, it tells me anyway, that, that we do have some, some challenges here, some broad-scale challenges that need to be addressed uh, to move these services uh, where they're needed. Picking up on that takeaway and referencing an earlier point made that looking at the, the evolution of the crime victims' rights movement and the proliferation of laws and policies, as I mentioned earlier, over 32,000 different laws and policies on behalf of the rights and services afforded to victims throughout the country since the passage of VOCA in the 1980s, that we've had this heightened policy response recognizing these needs, but that the reality in the lives of many victims victims, um, including as demonstrated by the NCBS, shows that uh, it, it really hasn't kept up and that we have a long way to go into delivering um, a return on many of those promises made to victims. Thank you. We had a couple of questions during the presentation regarding um, anything that we know about victims of drunk driving. Are they included in any of the broad categories in the NCVS, or is that, um, is that crime one that's going to be included when the NCVS is adjusted? Um, to my knowledge, that is not a crime that's going to be estimated in the NCVS in the future, but I, I am not 100% certain that this is the case. The final decisions have not been made for the survey content. One of the challenges, though, of determining um, a, a crime such as drunk driving or <clears throat> being under the influence is that oftentimes the victims don't know the answer at the, by the time that they're interviewed. They're interviewed within months of the event. They might not know if, if the investigation was completed and if, there, if this was a case of drunk driving or not. So there, they, there are additional challenges with measuring that crime, and I and the decision as to whether or not that should be measured in the NCBS versus another federal survey, such as one by the Traffic Safety Institute, would be um, is a decision that has to be made. All right, another question has come in. Do you find that victim service providers have difficulty collecting the variety of information or demographic data that you want to collect? For example, when providing hospital advocacy during a forensic exam, it may not be appropriate to ask a victim questions about their income and so forth. Uh, do you notice any trends in specific data points that are more difficult to collect? And are you able to account for those gaps in the data? Yeah, this is a really important question, and I have referenced before the new report issued by OVC that is now available on the website and that we've shared through the chat. This is the Victims of Crime Act Victim Assistance Formula Grant Program. This provides a more detailed level of information on some of these demographic and other categories that you've referenced than has ever been publicly available before. But as your question points out, there's still a lot of challenges 
challenges in how consistently all types of providers are able to track this critical information. And then there's a lot of reasons for that. Obviously, there are challenges in capacity and being able to, to keep up with um, arduous data reporting requirements, especially when the priority of VSPs obviously is their direct service work. But even when entities have the infrastructure and the capacity to methodically and consistently uh, collect data, there are certain categories for exactly as you've alluded to, like sensitive um, aspects of the victimization experience or the victim's identity that they might not want to disclose and that providers may not want to ask for. So if you check out that OVC report, um, you can see some of these categories. But again, as your question gets to in translating the significance of these percentage percentages, it's really important to note how many providers were actually able to report on those factors so that we understand the true picture that it's representing for the field. All right, thank you. It looks like we have answered all the questions that have been submitted. Again, participants, if you have not completed that poll, please do so. Uh, we are required to um, report to OVC what you think of our work here. I want to thank Janet and Heather once more for all of the time that went into this presentation and for sharing this information with all of us. This has been so valuable. Do either of you have any closing comments? I'll let Heather, I'll let Heather handle that. <laughs> so thanks, Janet. Well, just um, kind of on, be, on behalf of both of us just want to thank everyone again for participating. Thank you for your thoughtful comments and questions that you submitted when you registered. We are very much reviewing those and keeping those in mind as well. And again, just to remind you that as you think about what we've shared today and, and have conversations in your communities and with your partners about what this means for your work, we would love to hear from you and collaborate further on our uh, continuing analysis of these questions for the field. So thank you again. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, I see that our poll has timed out. Jason, if it is possible to repost that, um, I would be grateful if you could. Otherwise, thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. And we will let you know when the recording is available and the slides are up. Thanks again so much. Bye-bye, everyone.